Hello and welcome to The Drum, I'm Steve Kinane. Coming up, who's behind the Sony PlayStation hack? What does China really think about Australia's human rights concerns? And why the Chase's royal wedding coverage has been pulled by the ABC? Our panel tonight, Marius Benson from ABC News Radio, Sue Cato from Cato Council, and author and blogger Anthony Lowenstein. Sony is in major damage control after a security breach that's compromised the personal details of millions of PlayStation users. The electronics giant shut down its network a week ago after discovering what it dubbed an external intrusion. Today, Sony confirmed the worst-case scenario, that hackers had gained access to top information, including names, birth dates, passwords and possibly credit card details from 77 million account holders. Computer uh, security expert Lloyd Borrett says PlayStation users should play it safe. People have got to wait to find out from Sony as to just what has got out, uh, and hopefully Sony will notify people. Um, a general thing, though, is it's common for people to have the same usernames and passwords on multiple accounts that they have on the in on internet services. So if someone is uh, on the PlayStation Network and is using the same username and or same password elsewhere, uh, then the first thing I'd recommend they be doing is changing the passwords on the other services that they use. Sony says there'll be an independent probe into what happened and its security system is now being rebuilt to better target, uh, protect users. Marius, this is a big deal. 77 million people potentially uh, opened up to identity theft. 77 million people, it is a big deal. I did an immediate security check at our place. I turned to the 11-year-old and said, are you on <laughs> PlayStation? And he said, Xbox. Yep. So we're in the clear. You're in the clear. I, decades ago, at the dawn of emails, in my memory is it was about the mid-'80s, um, an incident occurred that caused me to... to be wary about putting anything on a computer because a colleague, to the surprise of everyone in our part of the ABC at the time, was promoted over all other people and uh, given a very high job from a very low job. He immediately sent a gloating email to friends in England and came in the next morning to find that email printed out a copy on everyone's desk. Oh dear. So I think the domain of the computer, the domain of the web is pretty public. But, but these days you can't do that because there's a lot of very private information there, there's financial details. A big deal, 77 million people. And Anthony, uh, the, the head of the New South Wales Fraud Squad today said that he, he thought people should maybe cancel their credit cards who, who had PlayStation accounts. Well, I'm not surprised he does say that. And one of the things, I mean, the bigger picture stuff about what has happened to Sony is that too many of us, I think, have this presumption that we trust companies with whom we save information, whether it's Google, Yahoo, and we see in, in many non-Western countries how often there are often breaches by hackers of personal details of email accounts. This is not quite like that as far as we know. I guess my point is that it's happened to Sony, it's happened to Google and other places, emails often have been wiped or hacked and I think we live under the illusion too much in the West that this stuff only happens over there, i.e. not in Australia, America or Europe. And so questions are being asked to Sony and why they delayed announcing this six days after they mm. found out what was going on and a US Senator, Richard Blumenthal, has written to the CEO asking for a please explain and there are some people speculating about whether Sony might have delayed it until after they launched their tablet in Japan. Oh, where to begin? I mean, first of all, if you were going to actually be hit by this uh, horrific wave of bad press, the last thing you'd do is put out your little bit of good news and then have the bad news following it. You'd want to get the bad news out of the way. No, this will take some time, obviously, to subside. Then announce the tablet as a hope for a little bit of good news to sort of, you know, be the break. So to do it the other way around is sort of just defies any, any sense of logic. But, you know, I've got to say... It was very good of Sony to finally show a little bit of caution. I think they were saying um, an abundance of caution, warning us that uh, not, I'm actually not a, not a gamer, but warning us that our credit card details uh, might be in danger, having already lost people's names, addresses, dates of birth and, yeah. um, and sundry other information. Credit card you know, information. Uh, yeah. But, you know, this was, that was saying abundance of caution. They yes. may have also <laughs> lost the credit card information. Yes. So, I mean, for me, you look at, first of all, how on earth did they keep this quiet for six days? You know, if you look at what the gamers are saying on, you know, in various posts around the place, they're less concerned about security mm. and more angry because they haven't been able to play games. Yeah, I mean, that's right. Know, there are plenty of different states. You know, the government's going to be looking at this, the regulators, you name it, are going to be looking at it. But how on earth did the gamers 
not get the truth out of people in Sony for six days. It's amazing. So, so a big part of your job is helping companies go into damage control. What, what will this do for Sony's brand, do you think? Well, Sony's actually got a big problem, but so does probably almost everyone else in the industry. And you notice no one else in the industry is out bagging them, because mm. I suspect there are a few they glass houses naked. around there. Yeah. And so the last thing they're going to do is put their hand up and say, you know, aren't we fabulous? But I think um, Sony's going to have to actually prove uh, that it can hold information securely. Well, we'll talk more about this issue when Mark Pesci joins us a little bit later on the drum. Despite some pressure from Beijing to avoid the subject of human rights, Julia Gillard has stressed she did raise the issue during her meeting with the Chinese Premier. I did express to Premier Wen uh, my concern and Australia's concern about the treatment of ethnic minorities, about the question of religious freedom and about recent reports in relation to human rights activists. But according to the latest round of US diplomatic cables given to the Fairfax media by WikiLeaks, Chinese officials don't take Australia's concerns too seriously. The confidential briefings provided by Australian diplomats to their American counterparts reveal that China has stuck to boilerplate responses on human rights and its officials have been sharp and aggressive when asked about abuses in Tibet. Marius, more uh, revelations into the wonderful world of diplomacy, courtesy yeah. of WikiLeaks, and yeah. it seems like the Chinese are a bit dismissive of Australian concerns. Yeah, I was interested watching Bruce Haig on the drum yesterday as an ex-diplomat talking about when you're actually in there and things are brought up that everyone knows are going to be brought up, like human rights with China. Mm. Often it's just an eye blink, you'd miss it, and it's a very diplomatic moment. But clearly there are undiplomatic moments as well, courtesy of WikiLeaks. And that's not a surprise, I think, uh, that... Um, China would be uh, quite prepared to say, well, if you think we're doing such a bad job in Tibet, what about that flash job you're doing with indigenous life expectancy or uh, Christmas Island? And uh, I mean, there's no equation between the two, but it's a, it's a counter-argument, and China would be happy to use that counter-argument. So it's not a surprise, and WikiLeaks has confirmed that that's exactly the sort of thing that does go on, and you would expect China to do that. But I think admonishing China is part of the, of the, the standard procedure. Julia Gillard seemed to admonish slightly more strongly than John Howard, a little less fervently than Kevin. And rud, but it's water off a Chinese duck's back, I'm sure, because uh, China increasingly is less sensitive to Western views. So, uh, Marius raised a few points there mm. that, that China raises of Australia's human rights concerns about Indigenous Australia, but also staggeringly, they brought up the issue of media freedom. Uh, what, what does that say <laughs> about Chinese hypocrisy when they're talking about Stephen Conroy's internet filter, given their own attitude to media freedom? Well, I've got to say, I mean, clearly they're able to actually sort of play poker quite well, because, I mean, I'm sure various people were, were giggling behind their hands one way or another. But, you know, isn't it interesting that, on one hand, we criticise some people for annoying China, and on the other hand, when they're actually saying, hey, talk to the hand, we don't care... Um, you know, there, there's other criticism. I mean, the fact is, it's not in Australia's interest to always be patted on the head and told by China that we're doing the right thing and we're playing the game nicely. If you remember, there was all that attack on Kevin Rudd for, you know, being too rude for them and not being liked. Well, I don't know. I mean, you know, sure, we've got to keep doing um, massive deals and we'll need them as a trading partner and they are a global power. But, you know, to what point are we actually able to, you know, pick a fight with them? And it does show that Australia does um, raise these kind of concerns like the death penalty in China and also issues around yeah. Tibet. But it also shows the tactics that the Chinese employ yeah. uh, in these diplomatic conversations. Tell us a bit more about that. Um, one, one of the things that came up in the documents was the sort of things that they were saying to try and, you know, speak in long sort of sentences or long speeches to try and avoid actually talking about human rights. I mean, to me... So long monologues? Long monologues. Yeah. Sorry, that sounds a bit like Parliament House. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or Kevin Rudd, for that and, Well, exactly. In Canberra, but, I, mean, I guess one that. of the things about this issue to me this really is such an embarrassing elaborate dance. I mean, this issue has been talked about that Australia cares about human rights in China. I mean, we've seen for years that if, we, if Australia is so concerned about human rights in the world in general, has there been, for example, any comments in the last few days to the US government about Guantanamo Bay? I'm guaranteeing or probably the, or not. Or the death penalty. If they're talking the death penalty, the death penalty in China, are they talking so about I think, the US? I think it's sort of a sense that the media every year, whenever an Australian leader goes to China, mm. is going to raise human rights. Everyone gets a bit excited for a few days. I mean, China wouldn't care. And why would they care? Mm. Because they know, and we know, China needs frankly, our resources, and we need them for our economy. So that's the reality. Well, and you mentioned uh, the, um, Guantanamo Bay there and the treatment of prisoners there has been back in the headlines this week uh, with 
the release of US defence documents about Mamdou Habib and David Hicks by WikiLeaks. Now serious questions have been raised about the physical and mental health of detainees and a report published in the Public Library of Science Medicine Journal claims that doctors and medical staff were complicit in torture. Now, um, so some pretty disturbing information in this report that medical doctors and mental health professionals were neglecting and concealing medical evidence that was consistent with those who'd been tortured. Well, I mean, let's pull back and look at the situation they're in. They're in the mid middle of a major military compound. They're either going to be part of it or not know about it. Neither, you can't believe that not knowing about it's a possibility. And they stayed on the site. So, I mean, what really are the options? You know, how could it be any different than that? And you don't I'm not think saying they can it's speak right out or wrong. about it. I'm, yeah, but speak out about it, and, and what occurs, they're taken off the site. But it's a dark part of medical history that I've, I've never seen coherently written. The complicity in crimes by by medical professionals, not unique to medicine either. Journalists, if that's a profession, certainly are complicit. And if you look at Nazi Germany or any time, they need professional skills, medical yeah. skills in particular. If you want to torture really well, you need some medical oversight, and uh, doctors do provide it. So it's uh, it's. Uh, uh, and Hippocrates, sorry, Hippocrates would be I was just going to say, one of the things that is so interesting about these revelations are that there are many medical groups in America that have been saying since basically 2002 that there have been major American medical organisations complicit in going to Guantanamo and many other black sites to administer medication, to do medical experiments. David Hicks and Habib both talk about medical experiments being done on them and other detainees. So clearly this is probably not going to be done by a soldier, it will be done probably by some medical doctor. And in America there's a, a raging debate about certain medical organisations that continue to work with the US government knowing that's what they're going to have to do. Anthony, this, this report quotes the uh, medical records of nine people. Is that enough to establish a pattern of neglect and concealment by doctors at Guantanamo Bay? <laughs> Yes, except the fact that there's far more evidence that's been coming out for years. I mean, one of the things I think that people often ignore is that these issues actually have been raised. WikiLeaks has revealed far more in the last few days and blessed for it. But some of these issues about medical complicity has been around since at least 2002. And have any professional bodies done anything about it? Well, that's one of the amazing things. So many of them have refused to actually condemn it. Mm. There's, it's almost like sort of moral... Um, paralysis about actually taking a stand and saying this sort of thing is wrong and therefore as a medical organisation we can do it. Some obviously have individual doctors but many have not. Marius, this, uh, this article calls for an inquiry into the extent of medical complicity in US torture practices and include an investigation into the relevant classified information. What, what chance that the US government would be in, interested in that kind of inquiry? Nil. The US government just doesn't like that sort of international oversight. It says it's uh, where the United States were exceptional and it, uh, it won't be signatory to various international uh, uh, bodies of authority and it's not going to allow that sort of intervention either. So Perhaps Andrew Sullivan was quite fired up about this on his blog today. He said either there is a rule of law or there isn't. Either we are a civilised country or we are not. Um, I don't think any country could lay claim to being totally civilised. Australia can't, the US can't, China can't. So I think, um, you know, we should all be a little honest about that. And while I'm sort of being a, a nice, caring, thoughtful human being-ish, you know, it's also possible-ish, it's also possible that there were doctors on the site who actually stayed silent so they could keep working and try and do the right thing. So we're damning right now everyone who's a medical practitioner who's mm. worked on the site. I'm just saying it's yeah. possible. I mean, Sullivan, I think, also was saying, and he's written about this for a long time, that one of the major criticisms of Obama is that Obama administration has refused to do any serious investigation into torture committed by the previous administration, the Bush administration. They refuse to. Obama always talks about looking forward, not looking back. The problem mm. is when you allow that behaviour to continue, which it does continue under his administration, people will feel like they can keep on doing it. That's the problem. And Obama, I think, is just what Sullivan, I think, was articulating today. But Obama wouldn't open that can of worms. Well, no. he's too scared to because he, he sees his political but, suicide. But also well, what's would... happening in his, own, in his own government. I mean, what's under control and not under control? He could blow his, blow his own um, what's it say about Amaris, the he's got enough issues yeah, to the present, the, the present tends to be complicated enough for a US yeah. president without digging into the past. Well, there are calls for an international inquiry today as well after a United Nations report found evidence that both sides in Sri Lanka's civil war may be guilty of war crimes. The report paints a brutal picture of the final months of the war, saying that heavy shelling by the government may have killed tens of thousands of civilians. But the Tamil Tigers are also condemned for using civilians as human shields. Australian Gordon Weiss, the former UN spokesman in Sri Lanka, told Lateline last night both sides are responsible for the carnage. The Tamil Tigers unquestionably towards the end were holding the vast majority of people there against their will. Uh, this, this, we're talking about 50,000 families who were making 
survival decisions about where the best place was to go for them and how they could protect their children. Uh, on the other hand, the government of Sri Lanka was trying to extract the uh, Tamil Tiger gorillas from this mass of, uh, of civilians. Um, you know, I think there were, there were, there were very poor uh, decisions made on, on both sides. And Sam Parry from the Australian Tamil Congress has conceded that the Tigers aren't blameless.